Um, so, so for chapter four, it's about uh, exploratory data analysis with unsupervised machine learning. And the objectives of this chapter are to understand the variables that you have in your data set um, and to identify groups and identify outliers. Um, and then we have two main parts, um, one part about clustering and then one part about dimensionality reduction. Uh, so the first part about clustering, um, uh, the clustering means that you're grouping your samples based on their similarities. And the main questions that you have when you're making clusters are, are replicates similar to each other? Do the samples um, from the same treatment group have similar genome-wide signals? because um, it's about genomes here. Uh, do the patients with similar diseases have similar gene expression profiles and so on? And to answer these questions, we have to create a distance metric to find similar groups. And this book talks about three uh, distance metrics, um, the Manhattan distance, Euclidean distance, and the correlation distance. So the first one is the Manhattan distance. Um, and this one is the absolute difference between individuals for each trait. Um, so when we have our formula, you have the DAB means the distance between um, A and B, and then you have the absolute value and the sum of all of these values. So for all of these traits. And to have an example, the book used the gene expression of three genes. So if we look at patient one and two, um, this distance would be um, the absolute value of 11 minus 13 plus 10 minus 13 plus absolute of 1 minus 3 for the Manhattan distance. And then with the Euclidean distance, it's a little bit different. It's just the square root um, of the squared differences. And then we have the um, values for patient 1 and 2 again as an example. And then the third one is the correlation distance, which is just one minus correlation of two uh, individuals. And the correlation here is the Pearson correlation coefficient. And then we have a point about scaling before calculating the distance. And it's a bit like it's not a clear no or yes answer. It depends a bit on what you want to achieve. Uh, what your data looks like because sometimes you you want to keep extreme values and sometimes you don't um, but to scale we mostly use the normal standardization method which which means that you subtract mean from your value and then divide by the standard deviation and in r you can do this by using the scale function then we go to hierarchical clustering um, and this means that you join individuals into small clusters and then you join the small clusters together again. Um, and in the picture, it's a very simple one, but it could be like 100 individuals and you just keep joining until you have one group of all of them. So the result is a tree-like structure, um, also called dendrogram. And to uh, join patients together, you, or like individuals together, you use the distances that we just discussed. But to join clusters together, you have to look at different types of linkage to see which one is closest. It's not just the distance like we saw before. Um, and the four types of linkage that are meant uh, are mentioned in the book is a complete single average and then the ward D. And for the uh, complete link linkage, you use the largest distance between any members of two clusters to see what the distance of the cluster is. Uh, for the single one, you use the smallest distance. For the average, the average distance. And then with the ward, it works a little bit differently. Uh, they look at all different merging alternatives, and then they decide which ones to merge based on the minimum increase on the combined variance um, of those specific clusters. Then the book shows that you can also make a heat map, because in reality, you would have more genes, not just three. Um, and then they had an example of a leukemia data set where you have four different types of leukemia and then one group that did not have leukemia. And then this was the result of their hierarchical clustering. So you have the, the patients at the top. So this is the dendro 
frame that they ended up with. And then you just have one patient that is mis mismatched that is um, be being put in the group with no leukemia, but it does have leukemia. Um, but then the question is, how do you cut your tree to decide how many clusters you have? Um, so we have two methods of cutting your tree. You can cut at a certain height, what they did on the picture here, and then you end up with four clusters, or you can decide how many clusters you have and then start from there. Um, and the next part is about that, where you decide your number of clusters. So this is k-means clustering. Uh, so k stands for the number of clusters that you want. Um, and the way it works is that you decide your number of clusters and then the algorithm places centers, also called centroids, randomly around. Um, and then each individual gets assigned to the closest centroid. And all the individuals that are that are connected to one centroid, their um, mean value will be calculated and then the centroid will move to that place. And then everybody gets assigned again and so on and so on until the, the, the centroids stop moving because the sum of squared distances is minimized. So this one uses the Euclidean distance. And there's also a variant on k-means clustering, which is called k-medioids, and it works the same, but it uses real data points instead of, gen of just um, random places, and it uses Manhattan distance instead of Euclidean. Um, and then the book starts talking about uh, making it visible, um, but the, the second part of the chapter will come back to that one. So they give an example here of multi-dimensional scaling so that you can put all your data points in 2D. And then they show that the one of the clusters with leukemia patients overlaps a lot with the one that have no leukemia, I think they said. Anyways, it's like cluster two and three on the image overlaps a lot here. So then they talk about how you should choose your K. Um, in the example with leukemia patients, it's really easy because you, you have your setup, which has the four groups with that are um, diseased and one healthy group. So you have K is five. Um, but in general, when you don't have set groups, you have to pick a number and they give um, two main ways to do this. The first is a silhouette value, and it's a measure how similar each point is to the cluster it is in. It can range from minus one to plus one. Plus one meaning it's a very good mod match, zero that it's borderline, and minus one that is mess clustered. Um, so it uses a formula here, where S is the silhouette value, and then a stands for the average distance between I and the other points in the same cluster. And then B stands for the lowest average distance of I to points in different clusters. And then you've divided by the maximum of the two to get something that is absolute one or less. And they give an example of how the silhouette values would look if you plot them. Again, with the... Um, data that we just had. And then they discuss that you can also look at the average silhouette value because the, the previous plot is, is nice to look at, but it's not very clear. Um, so they, they calculate an average for each number of clusters. And then this one shows that four numbers, four clusters has the highest average silhouette value, which is what we saw on the previous plot because two clusters that we would want to be separate clusters overlap a lot. So the data finds four clusters. And then another way to um, calculate K is the gap statistic, which looks at the sum of within cluster variation. Um, so you can calculate that, but the problem here is that the within the sum of the within cluster variation only goes down if you have more clusters because each point will be closer to um, the other point in zone clusters when it gets smaller. So instead of just looking at that one, they compare it to a situation where each of the points are just randomly spread and then look at the difference between the two. Um, and that is 
the gap statistic. And then when we look at the plot, they see say that um, seven clusters have the highest value, but there is a rule that if your um, highest value is not bigger than the value of the previous one plus um, the error of measurement, then you keep the previous one. So in this case, they would go for six clusters. And then we also have some other methods, but the book doesn't really discuss that. It just says that it's a package called NBCLUST and that it has about 30 techniques, but you have to keep in mind that it's an exploratory technique anyways. Um, and then I started looking at the exercises. So this one's the first one where they say um, to scale the data and also scale the log two data. And the scaled ones look like pretty much the same, not entirely because you have a few values that were one and then get dropped to zero before you scale it. Um, and then I started as a second, but it didn't, it didn't finish yet. So that's, that's kind of where I am. <laughs> so yeah. Oh, your stand is gone. Oh, it's so interesting that it's like, it's stuff that I've been exposed to before, but like, I don't have the statistical background to like understand it, but like, I like how they're really like breaking it down and really trying to um, explain it piecemeal. So you actually, because you do need to understand like what test you're going to choose before you do it, as opposed to like in the past where I'm like, oh, I think this is what I'm supposed to do. I'm just going to try it. And you know, it gives me something that I'm looking for. So yeah. Yeah, I like that too. Uh, but it's just like when they when they talk about like choosing your K and then you have your silhouette or your gap statistic, like I understand what they do, but I still wouldn't know which one to choose. Yeah, and so I read more into that. And from what I have gathered, they're basically, I mean, granted, this is just on YouTube, but from what I've gathered is that it like, it doesn't matter what you pick. Because again, like you said, it is exploratory. Mm -hmm. And that you're really just trying to look for trends in this. This isn't like a definitive answer. Um, because I also was like, okay, well, how do you choose between Manhattan distance and Euclidean distance um, when you're doing analysis? Because that also affects how things get grouped together. And the answer that I found was that it doesn't matter. You pick which one looks fits your data and explains your data the best, <laughs> which is really not helpful when you're looking to make a framework of like this is how you're going to do this analysis and then so you just kind of have yeah. to keep trying until it looks looks right but to me like looks right is subjective like um and I guess it's what they try with like the elbow plots and the gap statistic is like trying to like actually quantify that but again how necessary is it oh, oh. Yeah. yeah I guess as long as it just doesn't look totally off anything's fine <laughs> at this point yeah, yeah. yeah. That's true. Yeah, I think so too. Mm. Uh, yeah, I'm pulling up the book. Um, if we, I mean, I know it's not quite the book, but I had found some really good, I can at least just drop in the link for um, doing PCA. Um, there's this guy on YouTube, his channel is called StatQuest, but he's actually a biostatistician. And so all of his examples are like genetic based examples, but he goes into the statistics of all this like very very clearly very slow and like makes really simple examples and I found his channel to be super helpful um and I've been going through and just listening to those um yeah. I can I'll do that I'll find his stuff right now find this channel I'm just going to put a new bone in the machine <laughs> right is it what oh yeah go ahead yeah Uh, Dr. For, for the dendrogram you presented, so what's the, I guess, what's on the y-axis? It's the, the distance between the points. Um, so it's how, how similar they are, I think. Let's see if they give a, a decent explanation. I think they did. Mm, where did I put the book? Here. Oh no, they just say the uh, the welcome to stack quest. Yeah, so they just say it's the distance between the clusters. 
that's it. Okay. The distance between the posters. Okay. Um. Yeah, so I don't know if we want to put the next part until next week and then we can just finish up um, chapter four next week or uh, and just call it, you know, cut it short today or we can, um, if we want to just like chat through the PCA examples or not, it's up to y'all. Both are fine for me. You can choose. Yeah. Um, I'm looking through the book chapter right now. Um, are you doing all of the exercises or, or not? I, I've been bad. I haven't done these exercises. I found, oh, I also need to share with y'all. There's another like statistic genomic thing that I found that I've also found to be incredibly helpful. I've been working because I, some of the exercises in this book, um, I needed broken down a little bit even further. So like I found this other course um, and I've been working through some of those as well. This is like, really for the statistics part of it. Cause that's just like, I have no formal statistics background. Everything I've done has just been kind of like picked up as I go. Um, so let me find that. And I've been working with those exercises. I have not worked through these exercises yet that I need to do. Um, did you have any uh, issues working through? Um, have you worked through them yet at all? I just I just started doing them now because I thought like from the from this chapter and, and and so on it will get more interesting to actually do them. But yeah. They're not they're not very clear. Like I did yeah. I did the first one because I thought it was like on the small data set, but then when I looked at the second question, it seemed as if they meant that I should have been doing the first one on the big data set already. And I was just very confused then. I was like, oh, so what <laughs> what should I do? Right, now? right, right, right. So then um, yeah. They're not the clearest, I guess. No. Um, these, I gotta find the link. I found these to be a little bit more explicit in the questions that they're asking, but they don't have answers to them, which is um, sort of frustrating. But yeah. if you Google hard enough, I've found some of the answers because it's actually meant to be like a, a Harvard EDX course. So like one of those online free courses, but this book um, really, really breaks down things um, pretty clearly. Um, I'm also dropping that link in right now. And so I've been working through some of these. Uh, and this one does it, does it go as far or? Is it more basic this in general? One, I, it, it's kind of both at the same time. I won't say basic, but it, it, instead of just like throwing all of the statistics in the chapter, it like breaks down the components, especially like for me, even just like how to read statistical notation. Because the first time I saw these formulas, I was like, what am I looking at? I don't know how to read this. Um, but no, once you learn how to read it, it's not so scary. It's just like yeah. doing that. So some of this has helped, especially like, um some of like the linear models so like it's probably this is 17 chapters that they have broken down to but like the equivalent for us is probably like the first like they're really breaking down the statistics and like the first 10 chapters of this is like just statistics basically mm. um so just to really help with the background and then they have their last chapters i think are pretty they correlate pretty much with ours. Yeah. Oh, it's nice that they have one on um, batch. That's good. Yeah. That's a nice one. Um, huh. So I've been using that as a supplement to this just to fill in the gaps. Um, and I can, I've been saving, well, I was saving my answers until my computer crashed. Um, the exercises for those oh. um, and like my solutions and like how I worked through things um which i'm happy to put on the our shared book club book club slides um but maybe for next week we could we'll go through um Dorothea, if you want to 
um, do the second, if you could do the second half of this chapter and then maybe we could spend some time like actually trying to talk through some of these exercises. I'll make a point to actually do them and then we can try to um, work through some of these. What do you, what do you guys think about that? Uh, it does sound good actually. Yeah. Because yeah. otherwise we just go to, through the theory and then it, it just gets lost again. Oh, that's... <laughs> Right. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's good to look at how it actually works and see if everybody has the same issues on the way or yeah. Right, right. Um yeah, I, I think you know, I'll try to work through like the eight questions in this exercise and then looking, I guess, compare answers essentially. That's our homework for next week. <laughs> that would be nice. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Sounds good. Sounds good. Um, yeah, and I, I was looking at the chapter three exercises too. Um, and thankfully, at least so for this, they do have all the answers. I think they had all the answers in this book. Um, I don't know. Exercises. <laughs> yeah, they do have the solutions on the. Um, they're on their GitHub page, but they have the um, answers. Uh, the yeah. answer sizes, the answers to the questions. Okay, where yeah. do they link to their GitHub page somewhere? Yeah, oh, just, um, it, on the on the book, <laughs> it's under the exercises in the book chapter part. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but then they say, I just clicked to open on the GitHub solution coming soon. <laughs> oh no. But maybe that's just for chapter four. Let's look at a, at a random other chapter. Let's see, eight. I don't know which one that is. No, also coming soon. <laughs> Damn it. Yeah. No. Okay. Well, we'll go through. Well, okay. I think that we can still discuss yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, we can still discuss it and just like figure out like what we did, what we didn't do. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. They have the chapter two exercises, but that doesn't really help. We're, <laughs> we're past that. Um, yeah, it's okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, they've got, it looks like this chapter four and chapter five. Well, oh, yeah, they've got some, but not all. Well, yeah, we'll just work through what we can. Why we do it together. Cool. Um, well, I guess in that case, we want to wrap it up for this week and just call it early. Yeah. That's um, fine. Yeah, I know you've got a lot more to do. I've got to get in the lab also. I got split cell. Um, as but, long as we keep working on it, it's fine if it goes a little bit slower. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'd rather go slower and get it done correctly and like actually understand it than just like try to, you know, plow through a chapter a day just for the sake of like, oh, we have to stay on schedule. Like, I, um, yeah. I know my January schedule gets a little chaotic, but um, like I'm going to be doing field work in January, so I may not be able to be on for some of these. But I mean, we can still keep working through it, and like we've got the Slack channel, so like yeah. we'll just do it again. Yeah, <laughs> sounds good. All right. Well, I'll um, I'll see you next week, and yeah. yeah, if you can get the um, the second half of those, and then we'll uh, we'll compare exercises and see what see how it goes. Yeah, sounds good. All right. Sounds cool. good. All right. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. All right. Bye.